Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Kevin Quinn from AMC Health. Um, we are pleased to welcome you to our inaugural uh, client profile presentation. Uh, this is a series of presentations we have designed to highlight the success of our clients' telehealth programs. Today's profile focuses on guiding your health plan's post-discharge transition to care program. The manuscript detailing this uh, Geisinger Health Plan telehealth program and the outcomes it, um, it achieved were recently published in Medical Care, the official journal of the Medical Care section of the American Public Health Association. Copies are available for purchase. Uh, you'll see on this slide uh, reference or information where you can obtain that, or if you like, I'd be more than happy to give you a free one if you reach out directly to me. It's an honor for me to introduce today's speakers. Uh, today, Dr. Maria Lopes, AMC Health's Chief Medical Officer, and Dr. Jove Graham from Geisinger Center for Health Research, uh, who is also the principal author of the manuscript that was recently published in Medical Care, will be walking us through our presentation. We have a lot to cover today. Uh, Maria and Jove will be covering a lot of different uh, topics, a lot of different elements with regard to the program. Um, as well as the outcomes that were achieved and the analysis that was performed um, to, to determine those outcomes. Um, if at any point along the way you have a question, feel free to um, ask that question. At, if you look at the lower, um, you'll see at the bottom right corner of the, uh, of the screen there's an opportunity to, to indicate a question and just simply hit send and we'll see that here and respond to you. Uh, the intent for us is to answer, have a Q&A session at the end of the process or at the end of the program today, but um, we hope to get to everyone's questions. If not during the presentation, we'll certainly follow up and address your concerns or questions at a later date. At this point, I'd like to turn the presentation over to, over to Dr. Lopes. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I think we all recognize the challenge around 30-day readmissions. Uh, it's certainly a significant issue uh, for uh, Medicare membership with 17.6% uh, of Medicare beneficiaries um, hospitalized within 30 days of readmission. 50% of uh, those members, um, again, readmitted, and uh, many of them not having had a uh, outpatient <clears throat> follow-up with their provider. In fact, members who don't have a follow-up with their provider are assumed to be at about 10 times the risk for readmission. Uh, and now we have um, some alignment of incentives with the Affordable uh, Care Act, which directs CMS to track readmissions and uh, implement penalties. So we know discharge planning is often variable, multiple gaps in communication uh, can exist, uh, and care delivery and care coordination uh, is often uh, not uh, able to be accomplished in a timely manner. When we look at uh, the literature review using telehealth, uh, particularly in CHF, uh, Cochrane, uh, in a review of 25 peer uh, literature studies, uh, has uh, concluded that structured uh, telephone support and telemonitoring can be effective in reducing the risk of all-cause mortality, uh, as well as CHF-related hospitalizations. Uh, they can also improve other parameters, including quality of life, reduce costs, uh, and um, uh, can be associated with the use of evidence-based uh, prescribing. Uh, however, uh, literature can be mixed in terms of its conclusions, and uh, there really is limited research on post-discharge using interactive voice response, IVR. And in particular, one randomized controlled trial of patient-initiated IVR and heart failure, and this is the Chowdhury article uh, that was published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine 2010. Uh, this was a six-month uh, trial uh, in which uh, uh, members were asked to call in daily their, uh, their symptoms and wait with a primary endpoint around all-cause readmission. Uh, and as you can see, there, the conclusion was that there, no, there was no reduction in readmissions when patients were asked to initiate these IVR calls. Uh, of note, there was substantial dropout. Uh, about 14% of uh, patients never uh, used the IVR to begin with, and 45% uh, were certainly not using it by the uh, final week of the study. So at this point, having uh, addressed uh, uh, some of the challenges, I'd like to turn over the presentation to um, a success story to Dr. Uh, Joe Graham of uh, Geisinger uh, Center for Health Research. Thanks very much, Maria. This is Joe. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening today, and my thanks to AMC for inviting me to talk about this particular evaluation we did of the program that was being used here. Uh, I want to give a little bit of uh, 
context uh, for our environment and how the, the program fits into our health system here because obviously that's important in implementation of any program like this. So Geisinger Health System, we're located in Pennsylvania, and it really comprises three main divisions, uh, pro pro provider facilities, which are our inpatient hospitals and treatment centers, and then a physician practice group, uh, which includes primary care physicians, specialty care physicians, all of whom are employed by the health system, and they're located in 40 different community practice sites across the region. And so those left two uh, divisions comprise the clinic side of Geisinger. And then in addition to that, there is also a managed care company component or an insurance plan. And those include uh, commercial members and Medicare members as well. So a lot of the interventions and the care redesign initiatives that Geisinger has taken on have originated from the clinic side. Some have originated from the health plan side. Specifically, what we're talking about today um, in the context of a medical home program, case management, and then the interactive voice response is really an initiative that, that began more on the health plan side of things, but has been very much a collaborative effort uh, between the health plan and the clinic uh, with each group trying to c contribute where their strengths are. So me personally, I'm uh, not a physician and I'm not uh, employed by the health plan. I'm a researcher in the Center for Health Research and we're located underneath the practice group, um, so on the clinical side of things. So what I'll be talking about today, I was not involved in the design or the uh, decision making around the program itself, but, but brought in to assist with the evaluation of that program to try and look at the data and see what lessons we can learn from it. Uh, so. Uh, just a geographic orientation, again, I said we were in Pennsylvania. Uh, Geisinger has a number of hospital facilities in red here, and then a uh, large number of community practice sites across central and northeastern Pennsylvania. And all of these are linked by a unified electronic health record. Uh, and then in addition to that, there's a large number of privately owned practices not affiliated with Geisinger that nonetheless have read-only access to the electronic health record that we do. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a fairly well-connected uh, region, um, though it's also a very uh, rural region uh, compared to maybe some other systems. So the specific intervention um, that uh, around post-discharge management uh, is really embedded within the context of a patient-centered medical home program that was started by Geisinger Health Plan and Clinic uh, originally in 2006. And uh, certainly the many systems with uh, medical home uh, programs going into effect now and, and building across the country, these programs are always very multifaceted. There's a lot of components to them. Uh, but the central idea is to try and redesign primary care to be more patient-centered to be more team-based, uh, and Geisinger's uh, program in particular has an emphasis on population management and case managers, which we'll talk about in a, in a slide or two. Um, so these are nurse case managers that are physically located within the primary care clinics uh, and are responsible for high-risk patients, chronically diseased patients, and also transitions of care. So uh, these are just a few more aspects of the idea of a patient-centered medical home, not all of which are directly relevant to the particular program uh, that we're studying here today or that we're talking about studying here today. But, uh, but it's important to, to note that uh, Geisinger began with the medical home concept in 2006 with just two clinics at first, and then that was expanded to another dozen clinics, and now today all the primary care sites uh, in Geisinger Clinic are using this patient-centered medical home model. Uh, and the, the part of that that's mostly directly, most directly relevant to the interactive voice response and the post-discharge are the case managers themselves. So as I mentioned, there are embedded nurse case managers that are physically work in the clinics as opposed to just in a you know, health plan office building. Um, so they have direct face-to-face -face contact with patients and families when they come in for visits. Uh, they have a lot of contact with the physicians and the nurses and, the, and really the whole office staff in these primary care sites. 
and they're responsible for typically 150 or more patients. Uh, these tend to be the highest risk patients, the patients that you know, are not a single disease management uh, case, but you know patients that have a com combinations of heart failure, COPD, things like that. Um, and then in addition to the, the most uh, chronically ill patients, they also take a responsibility for handling transitions of care. Anytime a patient is being transferred uh, from a uh, you know, hospital to home or between facilities. And that's really where their role in this particular intervention comes in. And so for a hospital discharge, what is supposed to happen is that within 24 to 48 hours of that discharge, the case manager is responsible for reaching out to that patient. Uh, and this is <clears throat> typically done by a phone, uh, but uh, an, you know, an actual person calling them as opposed to the IVR. And their uh, task in that phone call is to assess the, what the patient needs are in handling that transition. So they will do a reconciliation of the medications the patient's taking, see whether they need outside support services, which could include home health agencies, durable medical equipment, uh, area agency on aging services, uh, things like that, and then also ensure that the patient has a, both a care plan and a plan to visit the primary care provider, usually within three to five days uh, for a follow-up. And so this applies to any discharge case, whether they're in the hospital because of a heart failure exacerbation or if they were just in the hospital for something like gallbladder surgery or a hip replacement surgery, something that's not necessarily related to chronic disease. All of these discharge patients are getting this initial touch uh, and then being rather closely followed for 30 days uh, following that discharge. Uh, so I want to temporarily hand the presentation back over to Maria for a couple slides uh, to give a little more background on this specific uh, program and the, the different tools uh, being used here. Uh, thank you, Joe. So this slide really illustrates uh, two examples of um, uh, both with heart failure as well as COPD where these members are at particular high risk of being readmitted. Uh, and as Joe mentioned, uh, within this patient-centered uh, focus, there's some attempt at um, automation uh, with uh, di diuretic uh, titration protocols with heart failure, uh, where clinically meaningful information hopefully can be actionable and can make an impact. And that also includes uh, patient symptoms, daily weights. And uh, here you have telemonitoring, and as you uh, will soon see, the ability for technology to be an intricate part of the care management, care delivery process, so that the information from the patient's home is, um, is immediate and leads to very actionable um, and improved uh, outcomes. Uh, education is an integral part of what care managers are um, uh, dealing with, uh, with members, uh, as well as uh, patient accountability. Uh, so that they understand what they can uh, impact and control and, and uh, be able to self-manage. And then the constant outreach and improved communication to the extent that many times this um, uh, adds uh, in terms of complexity with multiple uh, treating providers uh, or uh, just the complexity of the multimorbid, uh, comorbid patient. So this is one example uh, illustrating uh, two specific disease states where this uh, high-touch care coordination uh, improves uh, access to care and the link with technology that can enhance uh, the delivery of that care in a more timely manner. Uh, as uh, Dr. Graham mentioned, uh, GHS's experience with monitoring uh, between 2006-2009, a very manual process. Uh, and very labor intensive, and the effort was really not very scalable. Uh, each call took about 30 minutes. Um, so as you could see, and I think um, industry is struggling with this whole issue of how do you obtain um, information, uh, meaningful information, but how can it be scalable and more affordable? In 2009, the process was automated and uh, known as the uh, Geisinger Monitoring Program. Uh, and again, focused at um, uh, integrating care management uh, with a component of technology. And as you see in the slide, this gets into the specific details. So every patient uh, was still receiving, upon discharge, a uh, care manager follow-up uh, call, 
who introduced uh, interactive voice response to appropriate members who really could participate. These were uh, obviously uh, members who had a phone connection, uh, but also were deemed appropriate uh, by uh, the care manager to be able to receive um, uh, the, the phone calls. It was structured as uh, one uh, IVR call per week, uh, each uh, over a period of four weeks. Again, we're trying to uh, prevent readmissions within a 30-day time uh, span. Uh, it was meant to be simple in terms of the questions being asked, two to three minutes. They had branching logic. And uh, the questions were uh, what nurses uh, would otherwise ask around medication adherence, around pain, uh, GI symptoms, uh, psychosocial support, uh, and for um, a wound care, uh, any, uh, any areas of concern. Um, the IVR calls did not replace, and this is critical, the IVR calls, this is not a substitute for uh, care management. Instead, it really enhances what they, that care manager uh, is, then becomes aware of what's happening within the patient's home and to be able to do the proper follow-up um, and even stratify the, uh, the workload. So at this point, I uh, will turn it back to uh, Joe to uh, go into the details of the study. Hey, Joe, uh, you might be on mute. Oh, I'm very sorry. I was on mute. Uh, my apologies. Uh, so I want to go into the details now of the, of the study design um, and how we went about evaluating this particular intervention. So the uh, hypothesis, obviously, was that the monitoring program, which I'm going to keep calling GMP for short, uh, reduces the 30-day hospital readmissions among case-managed patients. And this is an important aspect of the study design because we didn't want to try and compare a patient without case management to a patient who had case management plus IVR. So every patient included in the study that we're talking about did have case management, and then the difference uh, between some patients and other patients was whether they used the IVR or not. Um, this was both a pre-post design because we had information on patients before and after using the program and also a parallel design in that we had patients uh, who were discharged but did not use the IVR program. So we're combining those two sources of information uh, to try and look at the effect. Uh, the data sources uh, were demographic info, uh, insurance claims data from the Geisinger Health Plan side, and then some GMP-specific elements, primarily the dates of when the person was in the program or started using the program. And those were from over 3,700 Medicare Advantage members, again, all of whom had, first of all, at least one hospital discharge uh, because we're looking at admissions and then the frequency of readmissions. And they also had to have those hospital discharges be case managed. Um, from the period of 2007 to 2009. And again, statistical approaches to use both pre-post data plus control data. So <clears throat> this is the uh, a little schematic of how the cohorts uh, were arrived at. So at the beginning, or at the top, you see we started with 3,700 patients who met that initial inclusion criteria. Going down the left-hand side, there were 2,439 patients that did not use the GMP at all, and 19 of those had to be discarded because we didn't have any baseline data on them prior to their initial admission. So that leaves us a potential 2,420 control patients. Going down the right side, there were over 1,300 patients that did use the GMP program. Now, when looking at their discharge dates and then the dates when they started taking the calls, uh, there were uh, a number of patients uh, with a lag period um, so that they were not starting to use the calls immediately after discharge. And when we looked into why that was, uh, the answer that came back to us from the health plan were that certain patients were not being discharged directly to the home to where they could begin taking the calls. Uh, but rather had a more complex transition from hospital perhaps to a skilled nursing facility, perhaps to some other transition. And with the data available, uh, we couldn't identify a control patient that would be comparable to the 
uh, to that more complex pathway. We're really just interested in the sort of the typical patient who goes from being in the hospital to transitioned to home and accepting the IVR calls. So 445 patients uh, were taken out of the GMP group, leaving 888 um, that fit the more standard definition, and then 13 of those patients did not have baseline data. So that uh, left us with 875 uh, final uh, patients in the GMP cohort. Now just looking at uh, the, the timeline of, of various patients. So this is uh, looking at the period of calendar year 2009, because that's when the program was in effect, was our main period of interest. Uh, but we had data going back to 2007. So for different patients, they might have had an admission at different points during that year of 2009, which is marked here in red. And depending on that patient's admission date, we would then look back in a 12-month period to collect baseline information on them, including util prior utilization, cost, uh, other disease history in that period. And then we would look 30 days forward from that index admission to see whether or not there was a readmission. Uh, but for different patients, those admissions occurred at different times, obviously. And the other important thing to note is that as long as they were all case managed, admissions, an individual patient could contribute more than one observation. So if someone was had more than one admission in the data set, then uh, as long as they were all case managed, then those multiple admissions were used. So just a word about the uh, limitation of the study not being a prospective randomized design and the approach that you take to, to try and uh, adjust for, for possible confounding. So every, in every study you have a treatment and an outcome that you're trying to look at the effect of one on the other. And then there's covariates, some of which affect the treatment, some of which affect the outcome, and then confounders, or X2 here, that uh, complicate matters because they could affect the treatment choice and affect the outcome. And so the approach uh, to trying to deal with this when you have data on potential confounders, such as age, such as disease severity, things like that, um, is to calculate a propensity score, uh, which is the probability of the patient having received treatment given their confounders. And another way of saying that is just a, a score from zero to one that basically summarizes that patient's baseline characteristics and allows you to compare them to other similar patients that have a similar makeup of baseline characteristics. Um, so this helps to balance when you're looking at two groups of patients, uh, but the main limitation is that you can only use it for variables that you have access to. Luckily, uh, you know, with the claims data, we had access to many variables, um, but it's not necessarily going to balance things that you can't see. Um, so to continue on how that was used and how that was constructed, we looked at data from the 12-month baseline period for each patient leading up to their admissions, and we looked at sex, age, a CMS risk score, uh, their history of some major comorbidities such as kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension, uh, the number of readmissions and admissions in that prior calendar year, and their both inpatient and overall medical costs in that year um, to assign each patient this score. And then the score was used in two different ways as a sensitivity analysis. One, by stratifying the patients according to that score. So the idea there is that you separate patients into risk groups, uh, do the analysis, and then pull them back together for a final estimate. Or you can use that score as an actual covariate or as an adjuster directly in the models. Um, so we did both of those things to compare what kind of answer you get uh, in using the different ways. So from there, the statistical analysis was basically based on each hospital admission being the unit that we're interested in. And this is, again, a key point of the study, that the intervention was only activated when someone had an admission and a discharge. It wasn't something that was intended to apply to an entire population of patients. So our focused interest was looking at each admission and what, are, what is the frequency with which those admissions get followed by a readmission. So that was the, the focus of the analysis. We use logistic regression 
to model the effect of the GMP program on that readmission probability. And then in addition to the propensity score variables that I just mentioned, uh, we also, in the logistic regression, adjusted for both calendar year and calendar month um, because we know that hospitalizations uh, vary seasonally and then there could also be trends over time. So, uh, and finally, I know I mentioned it before, but just to reemphasize one more time, we are using both pre-post data from within the patients that actually use the intervention and also a control cohort uh, to arrive at a final result. Um, last slide on methods here, just uh, to emphasize that we use sensitivity analyses whenever possible to, to try and look at the data different ways and see how different the answers come back. Uh, in addition to using the two different approaches, the propensity score that I already talked about, there was also an issue in that there could be instances where a patient had an admission early in 2009 and entered the program, but then later in 2009 had another admission and they weren't necessarily automatically re-enrolled in the program. So you could have a patient uh, that was in the program and then later out of the program um, rather than permanently in the program. Uh, there were 127 patients like this uh, out of our original cohort that I described, and so uh, we took three approaches to those unusual cases. One was Per protocol, just if they were in, we treated them as in. If they were out, we treated them as out. Uh, an intent to treat protocol, which treated them basically if they were ever in, we just considered they were still in. And then finally, just a censoring approach, uh, taking out those complicated uh, observations. If they had already been in and they went out, then we just didn't look at them anymore. Um, and by looking at it those three different ways, hopefully we were uh, controlling uh, for the different types of bias that, that that complication might introduce. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about the results in a couple different ways. So first of all, this is just summarizing the patient populations at baseline before we start looking at readmissions. And so on the first column, you see the GMP cohort. In the second column, you see the control cohort. And then the remaining columns are uh, indications of how balanced those two cohorts are in terms of uh, the major variables uh, that we thought could potentially confound. Uh, so uh, you can see that the blue values indicate areas where they are balanced and the red values um, yeah, indicate uh, places where without adjusting they didn't seem to be uh, very well balanced. Um, so, uh, of the red values, you see the GMP cohort was slightly younger on average. Um, I just want to highlight the CMS HCC risk score uh, because the GMP patients were slightly lower risk um, than the control patients. And then there was a little uh, less frequent diabetes and hypertension as well. So, uh, then by using the propensity score uh, adjustment, both stratification and regression, um, the last two columns reflect the balance between the two groups after you've done that um, in two different ways. Um, you can see how the, the p-values there increase, uh, showing that the differences between the groups aren't statistically significant anymore. But then the last column is an indication of the difference, the standardized difference between the two groups, where small values are good because they mean uh, there's just small differences between the groups. Um, and so at baseline, um, these were the, the techniques that we used to try and adjust the, and balance the two cohorts as much as possible. Uh, keeping in mind that the, the final result, we're not just going to give a comparison of the two groups, but we're also going to use information pre-post uh, within the one cohort itself. So. Okay, so I want to present then the final, the readmission now comes in, in a couple different ways. First is the simple looking at the two cohorts against each other. Um, and so here are the groups of columns. First set shows the GMP cohort, second set shows the control cohort, and the rows are the different calendar years. So if you look at the top row in 2007, the percentage of readmissions per admission in the GMP cohort was 16.1% and that compares to 18.9% in the control cohort. So uh, two to 3% uh, difference there. 
similar in 2008. Then when we go to 2009, which is the year in which the IVR program began being used, um, the difference increases a bit between the two groups, uh, a 15.7% uh, readmission per admission in the intervention cohort as compared to a 20% uh, readmissions per admission in the controls. And so that represents uh, more of a 4% absolute difference, a 21.5% relative difference, uh, and that itself is a statistically significant difference. Now, that was comparing the two groups against each other. If we now just focus on the GMP cohort and look at before and after results, um, the first set of the first two columns here are the GMP patients, but before they used the program uh, with a 27.1% readmission rate and then when they start using the program, the time during which they're being uh, enrolled in the, in the IVR program, that rate dropped to 10%. Um, and it went up uh, slightly for those few unusual cases that we talked about uh, that might have had subsequent admissions where they were no longer in the program. Um, so looking at it that way, um, there's a 15% absolute difference, a 60% relative difference, in that readmission rate, uh, which is also uh, reaches statistical significance. So then finally, what, what I would say is the, the most robust uh, way of looking at the results because it combines the information from the previous two slides in the regression model is summarized here. Now these are uh, expressed in, in odds ratios uh, in the first column there, and then the uh, last column shows how that odds ratio translates into a percent uh, reduction in, in odds of readmission. And so these different rows represent, the, the three blocks of rows represent the different ways of treating the patients who dropped out um, and then had later readmissions. And then within each block, you see unadjusted analysis and then the two different ways of using the propensity score uh, to balance the two cohorts. So the, the main thing that I want to emphasize in this slide is, is not only looking at it nine different ways, uh, these all reach statistical significance, but if you just look at the magnitude of the estimated effect in all nine of these rows, they're relatively uh, consistent because, you know, if you look at the last column, it ranges from an estimate of a 35% up to a 56% effect. And if we had to, to pick uh, what we believe is the best or most robust estimate out of all of these, it's first of all from the top block because that treats people uh, truly as they were either in or out of the program. Uh, but then also uh, the last row within that block using propensity score to stratify patients so that you really are comparing similar patients and then uh, pooling the results back together is what gives us an estimate of a 44% reduction in the, that odds of readmission. So just a few words about the strengths and the limitations of the study. Uh, this, on the strength side, uh, as I hope I've emphasized, uh, we feel that even though this was not a prospective or not a randomized study, uh, we took as robust an approach as possible using both pre-post and parallel data and using a number of sensitivity analyses uh, which you saw on the last slide, all came up with relatively consistent and all significant uh, answers or, or estimates of the effect of the program. Uh, in contrast with some of these studies that, that Maria talked about and other ones that at least we're aware of in the literature, there was a very high compliance rate in this program. Uh, only 4% of the patients that we studied failed to take all four weeks of their calls. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I would guess that that's partly because the patient is accepting a call once per week uh, as opposed to being called every day or as opposed to something that they need to actively use to, to call in. I, uh, I don't have uh, qualitative data from the patients on reasons for that, but, uh, but certainly it makes sense that the, you want to have an intervention that's not uh, overly burdensome to the patient to get them to stay in it. 
Um, and even these patients that failed to complete, we did include them in the analysis and we included them as GMP patients. So if anything, um, if, if, the, if the program had no effect, um, the bias of including those patients should be not in favor of the program, uh, but, but rather the other direction. So the other, uh, you know, the facets of this study that are important to note is that we were studying a Medicare population in an integrated health system, and our particular health system has had a, an ambulatory EHR or electronic health record for a long time and a case management program for a number of years. Um, and we think it, that it's uh, notable that even on top of that case management program, we still saw this incremental uh, and significant effect of using the IVR um, within that environment. Uh, but then finally, though, the big limitation of the study, which we've addressed to the, the best of our ability, is that it is an observational study. And we've tried to minimize bias uh, in the design and the analysis, uh, but certainly there is a, a selection uh, of the case managers of the patients um, that we couldn't control in this environment or in this study. Uh, so that's uh, that, this is my final slide. You know, the conclusion of the study, and as we published in the paper in Medical Care, is that using the IVR with case management, as compared to case management alone in the population that I've described, uh, was associated with this uh, pretty significant relative reduction in 30-day readmission rates. And we would say that although there's certainly aspects of our system that probably helped the ability to implement this type of model, um, that uh, we don't see a reason why uh, other systems and other environments uh, couldn't take the same technology uh, and use it uh, for benefit as well. And with that, uh, that concludes my portion of the, of the study. Great. Thank you very much, Joe. In addition to Dr. Graham, we'd also like to acknowledge and thank a number of people from Geisinger Health Plan, Geisinger Center for Health Research, and AMC, who were instrumental in the design, the execution of Geisinger Health Plan's telehealth program, and who also contributed to the analysis of the outcomes as well as the completion of the manuscript that was recently published. At this point, I think we're ready for the Q&A uh, section of our presentation. Um, just as a quick uh, couple of footnotes, there's been a host of questions, a number of questions that have come in. Uh, many people are interested in, in receiving a copy of the uh, presentation. That will be actually forwarded to folks. We'll, I believe we'll be forwarding a link so that uh, you'll be able to access this information. If you would also like to uh, receive a copy of the manuscript, please reach out to me directly at either kquinn at amchealth.com or at the phone number noted below. Uh, so now we've also been pulling a number of uh, questions from those that have been submitted, so I think I'll just uh, pose a few, uh, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, one of the questions that was posed was, do you think asking questions via a PC home hub or smartphone rather than an IVR would be successful? Uh, I'll take that one. It, you know, the answer to that, frankly, is yes. Uh, we're actually doing a lot of work with different um, uh, approaches. Hub-based applications um, are, are also available through AMC Health. Uh, and if you think about it, it's all about connecting with a patient based on uh, what works best for them. In many instances, patients will be accessed most easily via their phone. Uh, they may be mobile, they may be on the road, uh, uh, or they may be, frank, frankly, folks that have issues, trouble hearing, uh, who may be in the home predominantly who would uh, benefit from being able to read the question and respond accordingly. So um, we think the appropriate setup for the, for based on the patient's needs is, is frankly very critical to ensure that you have an appropriate response to these questions. Let's see, um, if I may, Joe, a question was asked if we could describe or provide a little more detail uh, regarding the CMS slash HCC risk score that you referenced on page 24 of the presentation. Uh, certainly. So this is a, again, this is a Medicare Advantage population, and the HCC score is a hierarchical condition category score, um, you know, similar to a, some other comorbidity indices that are that are often used in this kind of research. So it is a, it's a number, uh, a, you know, a single number that usually ranges from zero to ten uh, for the majority of patients. 
uh, and it takes into account the number of, of diseases they have and is basically, you know, a, a, a way to quantify their disease, uh, their severity or, you know, their health severity. It's used uh, extensively in, on the medical or on the health plan side of things uh, to calculate Medicare reimbursements and things like that. So each patient is required to have one. Um, and so it was a readily available source in addition to other, you know, fields we might have had on, on uh, diagnoses and things like that. Um, so it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's not a perfect number because it's hard to s summarize an individual with just one number, but certainly uh, there's a, a sense that people with similar risk scores uh, on that scale uh, should be similar uh, in terms of their overall health, and um, and then that would both impact uh, that 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 would be expected to impact readmissions, and so it was definitely something that we wanted to include uh, as a potential confounder in the analysis. Okay, thank you very much, Joe. Hey, an another question came in from the audience. It says, "Can you clarify or provide more information about the IVR intervention?" Maria, would you mind taking that one? Uh, sure. So uh, if we go to slide, I believe it's 18, uh, here are the details of uh, the um, GMP program. And uh, basically every uh, pa patient deemed at high risk were still being contacted by the care manager and uh, the, uh, those that were deemed appropriate for IVR, and IVR stands for Interactive Voice Response, um, and uh, they, uh, so patients were selected for the IVR plus the care management program and compared, as uh, Joe described, to care management uh, only. And those that were uh, deemed appropriate received the one IVR call per week. The call was structured as a two to three minute interview. Uh, there was one call per week. The questions did vary uh, slightly week after week, but honed in on uh, follow-up uh, with, uh, with their physician, medication compliance, um, pain-related issues, anything that could potentially bring the patient back to the hospital or to the ER. Um, GI symptoms, uh, if they had psychosocial support, and again, if uh, they had surgery, uh, questions around incision, drainage, erythema. Um, and the key is that this information was then dealt with by the care manager who took this information and, uh, and so if there were uh, gaps in care or certain concerns that based on the symptom assessment would lead that, that care management to uh, interact with the patient, a follow-up call, or actually bring the patient into the office. Uh, the whole premise here is that by understanding what was happening in the home, um, and dealing with that information in a much more effective uh, way, you could avert a hospitalization or a readmission. Thank you, Maria. Another question came in in reference to, um, it states, besides IVR, did other tools, or other tools such as video conferencing or monitoring peripherals deployed? Uh, the answer to that question is no. Although we do have other programs with Geisinger underway where monitoring devices are being deployed, in this particular IVR program, uh, or in this post-discharge program, I should say, it was simply the addition of IVR to the, to the existing case management or care management model. Uh, let's see, next question. There's a question here, Maria, about the types of questions, the kind of questions that were actually asked. Uh, could you give a little more detail on that? Uh, sure, so again, a lot of, um these are patients that are newly discharged from the hospital. Uh, so thinking about what could bring them back, uh, so their post-operative uh, issues around infection, issues around their incision, uh, and uh, any concerns around erythema or drainage. So again, these questions are meant to be, they have some branching logic, so if the patient answers uh, yes, uh, that there's a series of uh, questions that then follow that would be different than if the patient answered no. Uh, but the bottom line is the reason uh, we believe this works so well is because even in, in um, a system such as Geisinger where you've already optimized uh, the care coordination with um, a high-touch uh, care management, there's still, this really illustrates that there's the opportunity to still uh, improve and reduce readmissions uh, if uh, we only had more timely information that 
and could be acted upon. Okay, great. I, I see a question here in reference to how often did the case manager contact the patient? Um, you know, that honestly depends. Uh, I think it depends on the patient's condition. It also depends significantly on the responses they provide to the actual questions that were posed via the IVR system. Um, let's see. Yes, uh, the, another question. <laughs> did the IVR data come back to the designated case manager? The answer to that question is yes. The, the, way the, pro, the, the way the program has been established is patients are actually assigned to case managers and um, the patient's panel of, uh, or I should say the case manager's panel of patients are what they evaluate and review uh, within, uh, on any given day when they log into the portal. So as a patient responds to a specific question, uh, that triggers an alert. The portal then stratifies the, uh, the patients based on all the answers they've received to highlight those that have uh, indicated an alert or need to talk to the clinician. Uh, and that's where they start their work day. Let's see. There's a question here about the mechanics of the IVR system. Um, how exactly does it work? How is it configured? Uh, does it uh, involve a computerized voice? Um, you know, the, the RIVR uses a branching logic. I think Maria referenced that earlier. It, it uh, takes the patient's specific information and takes, uh, takes it down a path based on branching logic uh, that's been specifically designed or programmed uh, based on the patient's uh, condition as well as um, the responses they provide. Um, calls can be scheduled based on the patient's convenience. Um, alert levels are, um, are really established by our, our customers uh, in advance of the, uh, of the program's launch and are constantly or frequently adjusted as necessary. We also have the ability to create any IVR um, using uh, professional voice talent. Uh, we don't use a computerized voice and uh, we can do it, uh, frankly, in any language. So depending on the needs of our customers to serve their specific client base, uh, we will um, accommodate as needed. Sorry, folks, I'm actually just reviewing a, a ton of questions here. Uh, I hopefully, we'll get to uh, most of these issues. If there are several that we miss, we'll, we'll circle back to you to make sure that we get back to you. Uh, here's a question. It is, uh, what if there's a problem that the case manager can't fix? For example, a medication order change. Well, the, the, uh, the purpose of information is that um, as it comes in, uh, in hopefully a timely manner, that you're able to improve the communication, uh, and some of this may involve a treating physician. So if a care manager is seeing um, concerning uh, responses, uh, typically that care manager may actually reach out to, uh, to the patient, uh, interact with the, uh, the, the physician prescriber, or, as I mentioned before, actually bring the patient into the office because the office is probably a much lower site of care than um, if you allow uh, the, the patient to progress and, and ultimately end up in the ER or the hospital. So the whole purpose of data is that it's clinically meaningful uh, and you do something with it. Uh, and some of that may involve uh, uh, interacting with the, uh, a physician or bringing the patient into the office for a further evaluation. Thanks, Maria. Okay. Oh, question. Are care managers nurses? Uh, yes. I believe that's uh, how the, the uh, in the Geisinger world, and Joe, feel free to step in, but uh, uh, the, yeah, absolutely. The, so, so they are nurses. Many of them have additional certification as case managers as well, uh, but they, they're definitely uh, nurse case managers. Great. Thank you, Joe. Hey, another, another question we've seen a couple times here is, uh, does this information feed into your EHR? And um, Joe, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but yes, uh, actually EPIC is a system of choice at Geisinger. And um, we at AMC Health have actually integrated with a host of different um, care management systems. Uh, so uh, the goal of, of these telemonitoring telehealth programs is to keep it very simple, as simple as possible, as Maria referenced for the patient, but also for the clinician. So it's got to be an enhancement to their uh, workflow. Um, so uh, that is a key element um, in these programs and our capabilities to deliver a flawless approach. 
Um, question, were the patients already working with CM prior to the index hospitalizations or were they assigned after admission? Joe, can you help us with that one? Uh, I don't have a table of that, uh, but the, both uh, cases w were included. So there are uh, patients, so if you remember that I presented on the sort of pre-post type of analysis for looking at patients before and after. Um, so those uh, patients, uh, which the numbers were pr previously presented, definitely were working with case management prior uh, to the index hospitalization here. But there are also patients, because I mentioned that this is not just hospitalizations for the um, highest risk patients, but also hospitalizations thing, like things, for things like elective surgery. Um, so there uh, were definitely some patients that may not have had case management, but the fact that they had a hospitalization and then were being transitioned back to home uh, prompted the case management. Thank you, Joe. Hey, there's, there's also a number of questions here in reference to ROI and cost. Um, you know, the true cost of this program is really the clinical support that's being provided. Uh, the incremental cost for the IVR is, is quite negligible, uh, honestly. So uh, when you calculate an ROI, uh, we anticipate it being rather dramatic uh, since the 44% reduction that was reported in Job's manuscript or the Geisinger report. Uh, compared uh, case management with the IVR versus case management alone. Um, but if you'd like to hear more and get uh, specific detail on that, uh, we'd welcome the opportunity to talk to you in greater detail. Uh, let's see. Any other questions? All right, folks, I, I think we've covered uh, the majority of the issues that have come in. I guess we'll hang on for a moment or two. Uh, if uh, any other questions come up after the presentation, please feel free to contact me. Um, again, at Kevin K. Quinn at amchealth.com or at the phone number noted. Um, at this point, I'd also like to thank, um, thank you all for joining us today. I'd also like to thank uh, Drs. Graham and Dr. Lopes um, and um, just as a, as a note of information, there will be a survey that you'll receive following the presentation. Uh, we would greatly appreciate if you take the two or three minutes or so to complete the, uh, to the survey. It'll really help us out a great deal in um, creating or continuing these uh, presentations in a manner and format that's uh, most beneficial to you. And watch for an invitation to join us at our next client um, uh, profile. Uh, we're actually working with several customers now to create the, the next presentation and we'll be reaching out to you with an invitation, hopefully within the next couple months. Uh, so anyway, thanks again for joining us all. We greatly appreciate it. And uh, please feel free to contact me directly if there are any questions uh, we haven't gotten to today, uh, either at kquinn at amchealth.com or at 212-537-0820. Uh, thanks again.